So I'm really, really excited to have with us for this, the last episode of series two, Dr. Jack Hunter um, has come on to have a conversation with me about all things weird uh, from the perspective of anthropology. So we're going to have a, a chat around some of the bits that we've covered in in this series and maybe maybe the first series as well, uh, just to get Jack's viewpoint. So Jack is an anthropologist researching consciousness, religion, ecology, and the paranormal. Um, so he teaches at the Sophia Center for the study of cosmology and culture. Uh, that's part of the University of Wales, Trinity St. David. And you're a bass guitarist as well, aren't you? I am, yeah with a very cool looking, I did, I did uh, check it out. Uh, is it kind of psych, experimental psych jazz, psych rock, psych yeah. jazz rock? That's about it. Space rock, psychedelic prog. Yeah, it's excellent. I, I enjoyed that. Great, thank you. And I think my uh, husband was particularly impressed that you are an ordained Dudist priest. <laughs> I am indeed. I can do weddings in some states in America. Oh, is it just in America then? In some states. I don't know. Not all states. I don't know about the UK. Oh, surely the UK. You'll have to sort that out. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for, you know, making the time to come and speak to me because um, I think I got in touch with you around the beginning of series one, just to say, you might be interested in this and and I was flabbergasted that you'd, you'd already listened to one or two of them so that was that was really great so I just wondered if you could kind of talk us through um really the kind of the theories that might apply to some of the um to some of the experiences that we've heard about in um in the modern fairy sightings podcast yeah well yeah I mean very broadly, my research has been interested in different ways that we sort of, um, or that people experience, we might call it the spiritual or the supernatural and all, all those kind of things. And my uh, doctoral research was not, not to do with fairies, but to do with um, spirit mediums in Bristol and uh, the ways that um, mediums use their bodies in order to manifest spirits, which is the title of the book, essentially. And um, what I realized with uh, at the Bristol Spirit Lodge and with these uh, the people who are basically devoting their daily lives to developing mediumship was that, you know, and I looked at it in a, in a sort of cross-cultural context as well, was that the things that they were doing um, of paying careful, close attention to uh, the body of the medium, picking up on small little movements and things like that, um, which were taken as indications that spirits were trying to manifest and then sort of honing in on that and establishing a dialogue and building up this gradual relationship with a particular spirit. And it might take, you know, it could take weeks or, or months for a spirit to fully manifest. But it, I realized that it was this, this gradual process of in-depth kind of observations that kind of linked these practices in with other you know, animistic kinds of practices or shamanistic practices uh, where, you know, people would, um, for example, you know, spend a lot of time in a particular place and focus in on the details of that place and engage in a dialogue with the place. So really the processes of manifesting spirits that I observed in the lodge are really similar to the processes engaged you know involved in manifesting spirits in a natural setting or you know in a particular place yeah so yeah I think that although my research was not specifically to do with you know fairies actually these processes uh, are running throughout all of this similar processes the way that um, invisible agents are manifested and the way that we interact and engage with them that's um seminar that you did recently about the Tanit Valley is really excellent it's it's so fascinating uh could you talk a little bit about that because I mean I think that that is really relevant also to to you know what we're looking at here yeah well um 
I'll introduce the Tanat Valley first. The Tanat mm -hmm. Valley is um, a valley in mid Wales, in Powys. It's where I live and it's where I've actually grown up as well. So I've lived here pretty much all my life, except for a brief stint in Bristol. <laughs> and um, it's uh, sort of a, it's, people think of it kind of like as a gateway into Wales. It leads from Shropshire, more or less, into the Berwyn Mountains. And then if you go up into the Berwyns, over the Berwyns, you end up in Snowdonia and then you're deep in, in Wales then. So it's kind of like a gateway into Wales. And it's, um, it's kind of rolling hills, um, valleys, uh, lots of little valleys shooting off this main valley, the Tanat Valley, which follows the River Tanat down pretty much from west to east towards Shropshire. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a lovely place. It's very beautiful. And um, there was a few stories that, uh, sort of folklore stories that I had been aware of in the area, uh, stories to do with, there's one story about um, a dragon or um, something called a guiber or a viper um, in San Ryder, one of the villages where I've lived. Um, which is a well-known story. And the primary school there even has a mural of this dragon on, on the wall there. So, you know, oh, people great. know about that story. Mm -hmm. um, there are standing stones in the village that are associated with the dragon. The story is that the dragon was killed on one of the standing stones after um, a wise woman told them to erect a stone, put spikes on it and cover it with a red sheet. And the dragon will kind of like bash into it on its way over. So those standing stones are still there and people know about those stories. Um, but there are other stories that people don't really seem to know that much about. Um, specific, specifically things to do with uh, fairies. Mm. Okay, so it seems like this fairy folklore in the area um, has kind of disappeared. And I only became aware of the folklore relatively recently. Um, I think well, it was last year or just the year before when my friend gave me a a copy of a book called A Wanderer in North Wales by Cledwin Hughes. And he was um, a Labour MP for Anglesey, a big island in the north of Wales. And um, he wrote in the 19, I think 1940s, it was published in the early 50s, um, about his, his wanders through North Wales, basically. And what was interesting about this, and this is my friend gave me a copy of the book, is that he explicitly mentions this area here that I live in and right. he talks about the Tanat Valley as well and he mentioned a few things in there that I found really interesting and that I'd never heard of before um, specifically referencing some places as the abode of the fairies places that I'd known of and spent a lot of time in my childhood um, and there are legends associated with that place but um, they weren't fairy stories that I was aware of so right. this was really interesting for me. Mm. <laughs> and um, he also mentioned, um, he mentioned the hounds of hell and how people had seen the hounds of hell on the slopes of the Berwyn Mountains right around where I grew up in St. Yeah. Um, and it, that, that sounded really interesting. I'd never heard that. I did know that there had been a UFO, a supposed UFO crash in the 1970s and the Berwyn incident. And that's a crazy experience in itself yeah um, <laughs> which i talk about in that talk um so you know there were there were things that i was aware of in the valley stories that you know and things like that but i wasn't aware of any specific fairy folklore and that's doubly strange because um i'd had my own fairy experience in the valley right <laughs> i kind of thought of it as an isolated event when it happened mm. um i didn't think of it necessarily as maybe being part of a bigger, you know, patchwork of folklore or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, because I wasn't aware of this fairy folklore. And my sister also had an experience um, when she was, well, when we were both younger, that she told me about back, at the, back in the day. And I, I recently asked her to describe the experience or write it up for me again. And yeah, she described how she'd seen in my mum and dad's house and it must have been about 1998 or thereabouts um this small she described him as a little leprechaun a small man about six inches tall uh with red hair and uh, sort of green shabby green clothes on and he did yeah. a little dance for her you know it's like a classic fairy experience totally it's a, yeah yeah 
amazing great one and um yeah and my experience was slightly less classic <laughs> but it was a psychedelic experience so it was in the context of my own my first actually first mushroom trip and i saw these small two-dimensional they seem to be two-dimensional creatures um in the grain of wood of a chest of drawers the drawer was kind of hanging out of the chest at the top and they were in the grain of the wood and um it was like a little procession and they seemed to be um moving along deliberately and all the other kind of psychedelic stuff was going on around it but these little goblin looking creatures uh, were doing their own thing and they they clocked me they looked at me um but they were not fussed <laughs> That I'd seen them, and they just kind of carried on with their procession, mm. and I must have um, sort of lost interest in it, and um, you know, started to pay attention to something else. But again, it's that in attention thing that I was talking about. With you know, when you when you're in these psychedelic states, you can get very you know intimately focused onto something very specific, and you know, perhaps that was a contributor to this experience that I've had. Similarly, my sister's experience was while she was. You know, falling asleep, right? Hypno, hypnopompic or hypnagogic kind of state. Mm. So you know, but those experiences occurred before I was aware of any of this extra folklore. Yeah, that I've become aware of. So when I started to look into that, I started to find lots of interesting things, and I found one particular experience that happened at the beginning of the 1800s. It was written about by a guy called um, Elias Owen, mm. who collected a lot of folklore in Wales. And he lived in Shanna Blodwell, just down the road from here. There's a plaque in the church there, if you go in, that says, to the memory of Elias Owen, author of Welsh folklore. Oh, great. Nice. Yeah. yeah, very good. And uh, yeah, he wrote a little story about this guy who lived in a village. Uh, it's, it's not even a village. It's a little hamlet called Bulchada, which is between San Gedwin, where I live, and San Vosin, where I went to high school. And um, in the story, this man wakes up in his, his bedroom, and he's only got a very simple little bedroom, and he sees um, a little man sitting on the end of his bed uh, with a fiddle, and he, you know, he's playing the fiddle furiously, like the fairies do. And there's, there's some smaller fairies dancing in a circle on the floor in his room. And he asks them, uh, who are you? And they say, um, which it means spirits of the air in Welsh. A very strange thing for them to say. But it kind of it has these kind of animistic, almost undertones in it. Like they, these are spirits of the air. Um, but it's very strange, you know, this experience in the same valley, essentially the same as my sister's experience, separated by 200 years or something like that yeah you know very odd so the, you've got an issue you know thinking about the relationship between experiences and folklore um, which is something interesting to ponder and landscape and landscape of course yeah and there were other other stories that i found specifically about cry Cruach, um one of the mountains um in Llangunog, yeah, it's where I grew up. And in, when, I, when I was younger, my sister, sisters were younger. My cousins would come from Liverpool and we'd all like go and climb around on the mountain and spent a lot of time on there. Um, me and my friends in the band had gone up into the caves and we jammed in the caves and all sorts of things. So, you know, been all over this mountain and scrabbled it and you know, knew it inside mm. out pretty much. And another interesting thing about it is... Um, when my cousins used to come, we would create um, and draw maps of the mountain and create sort of like a mythical kingdom on there. And all mm -hmm. of the parts of the mountain, we'd kind of given names. And we said like dwarves would live in that. It was kind of like, you know, Lord of the Rings kind of rip off stuff. <laughs> but, you know, we were kids. But, um, you know, we were saying like, this is the, e the area where the elves live and this is the area where the dwarves live. And, there are goblins down in the mines and that kind of thing. Yeah. And all of it completely unaware of the actual folklore that's associated with it. Just you know, kind like of instinctive, saying, more of an instinctive yeah, play. Mm. 
is it yeah. like is there something about it that kind of feeds out so that some of the actual folklore that i found um is amazing there's um a local archaeologist called robert richards in the 1930s and um he published his writings in the Montgomeryshire collections, which is published by the Powisland Club, who are like the uh, learned society of Powys, uh, based in Welshpool. And he wrote, some, he wrote up some of the folklore of the town at Valley, having grown here, grown up here, and he explicitly mentions Cry Gruath, and he, he talks about how um, it was well known as a haunt of the fairies, and the hut circles that are on top of it, because on the top of the hill, um, it's been used for a very long time. Um, on the very top, there's an Iron Age hill fort, and you can go up there and you can see all of the hut circles. And in the 19th century, Llangarnog was actually one of the most heavily industrialized parts of the country, mining um, slate and right. um, lead. So it was a massive industrial place at one time as well. It's not anymore. Mm. Okay, so there's all of the remains of the mines on the mountain as well. Anyway, Robert Richards described um, the local beliefs about the hut circles, and he said that um, the people thought that they were uh, portals, essentially, or gateways for the fairies to come in and out of. So when the mist descended, he said, or when nighttime comes, then this is, the, this is where the fairies actually come out of. That is the interesting. The Iron Age housing. Mm. Yeah. So the mountain is a, a real sort of um, fairy mountain. And I found some other stories about it as well in different books. Um, one story about um, an old hag who lived down in the mountain. And it was uh, taken from, you know, so you can imagine this place was an industrial time in an, an industrial place in the 19th century. And they would have been looking, you know, going into the caves and things, looking for places to mine, really. Yeah. Um, like prospecting, I guess. Yeah. And the story was that these men um, went on to Cry Earth. They had, you know, a handful of candles, as many candles as they could find. And they, you know, used them to go as deep into the mountain as they could. And when they got into the mountain, they found um, an old woman living down in there with a big brass pan uh, washing her, washing clothes in there. And um, this is super weird. <laughs> I mean, amazing stuff yeah it is but, but that you know you wouldn't know about it no one has ever told me a story even remotely like that about the mountain in all the years that I've lived here um you have actually have to go into the archives and, and dig it out to find it yeah but very interesting yeah. but, but I think that that's I mean that in itself I think is an interesting aspect of this that somehow as you got deeper into things things were revealed because I know that you said that you know at one point you did try and look for information about um, folklore around the area and it just wasn't forthcoming and yet that seems to be something that happens as a part of all of this is that you once you start sort of getting into things um, it kind of reminds me of uh, you know it sort of reflects what's whatever stage your research is at if you like and where where you are and uh, um kind of connecting with it on some kind of other level may I'm, I'm, i was going to say spiritual level but i don't know if that's the right word but it just does seem that things are revealed at the right time so it is just really fascinating that that's all was it was able to kind of come together and i'm sure you'll probably find more now as well well hopefully now yeah. that it's out there um because you got a few bits from the the public as well didn't you when you put something in the local is it the local paper and then I did yeah, yeah. and um there's an interesting thing here as well I, I was talking with someone recently um because because obviously we, this is wales so people speak both welsh and english here and some people are you know more welsh than others and um, the the questionnaire that i put out was in the the chronicle which is the english newsletter right i haven't put out a welsh language version of my questionnaire yet and i'm planning to in the welsh uh, newsletter the uskid or, or uskid so i'm wondering whether i might get different responses from the the welsh newsletter yeah as well yeah so, you know the things uh... that i did get were li little just tiny little 
tidbits that suggested that there might still be, um, first of all, maybe people are still having experiences or people have been having experiences in contemporary times, but also that there might still be a hint of the folklore as well left of the stories as well. And some mm -hmm. people had said, for, for instance, that their grandmother or something along those lines um, had seen fairies dancing at the bottom of the garden yeah. um, in their old house. Um, in fact, I got two, two people saying that about two different houses. Um, the interesting thing about this as well is, you know, these household experiences is that they seem to be clustered around pretty old houses. <laughs> like my experience, uh, my psychedelic experience was in the 16th, 17th, 16th century part of my friend's house. Oh, wow. Okay. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. And um, these two houses that were mentioned, both of them are old listed buildings. One of them is a, you know, a, a 17th century timber framed mm -hmm. house. So again, there's an interesting, I don't know what the relationship is there, but it's interesting. It's undisturbed, I guess you could say, is one thing that it's it's been left undisturbed. And, and the same with a lot of, um, you know, when, when things happen out in nature, that's often in, not, not always, but often in nature reserves, places that have been left undisturbed. So maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. It could be, yeah. Had uh, anyone? Sorry, go on. No, go around. I was just saying um, it's interesting. With with the guy when you were at his house and you you had that psychedelic experience. So, um, he and his family, none of them had ever sensed any kind of fairy, um, presence or anything like that in the house before. That's a good question because um, I haven't really asked. But yeah, I was going to say about the um. The room that my experience happened in oh yeah that um it was actually it was all decked out with um stuff for magical ritual because my friend um his older brother it was his room and you know he gave us the mushrooms as well <laughs> as you know as you can imagine um but he was into wicker and he we had the there was um a chalk circle drawn out on the floor um, you know, we weren't doing any, yeah, any ritual yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or anything like that. We were just listening to a Juno reactor or something like that. And um, yeah, so, but, you know, I think it could well have contributed, you know, because obviously magical circles <laughs> are yeah. well-known fairy portals. Absolutely. Uh, were you, where was the circle? Was it? Um, in relation to where you were sat and where you saw the fairies? Yeah, the, well, the fairies were in the chest of drawers. Uh, so I would have, the circle was on the floor and um, we were just sort of sitting around the edges with cushions and things. Okay. And um, I was, yeah, I must have been looking across the, across the circle to the chest of drawers to... Okay, yeah might be a factor that it that is very interesting I mean I think you know that together with thinking about when you used to clamber up the mountain with cousins and um and even when you went in the cave with your with your band and, and friends and all of these things feel like at the very least communing with the landscape on some level um and maybe even an offering of some sort so if you're playing music in there um that kind of maybe feels like a bit of an offering but but all of this it really does make me think about um particularly the kind of outdoors ones about communing with the landscape and you know i was i was thinking after um watching the, the tanat valley um lecture seminar um I was thinking about some of the episodes of the podcast, in particular, The Guardian of the Mountain, where he had actually, um, he'd been up the mountain into a cave up there, the guy and, and um, the guest. And um, there was a, a chapel on the mountain next to the cave. And he had been in the cave and he had performed some kind of ritual uh, before walking back down the mountain. 
with his friend. Um, and they'd been they'd done that loads of times. It was something, you know, they'd, they'd known that mountain again since they were kids and um, were just so familiar with it. Um, I think that that's another factor as well, the kind of familiarity. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, they had this incredible moment where this wolf appeared, uh, but it didn't behave like, well, first they heard the growl. So there were different aspects to it. They heard this piercing, you know, growl, and they were both completely terrified and stood to the spot, um, as you would if it might have been a wild animal as well. But then at the same time, running within that fear, he had this sense of, but I know this is something otherworldly. And somehow that kind of, that sort of um, um, anchored him so that he didn't become, um, you know, too too terrified by that. It, it was it was always he was kind of telling himself, "I know this isn't real," kind of thing. I well, not that it's real, but I know this is from another world. Um, although he did at the same time have this fear that they were going to be killed, um, which is terrifying. And then they they saw it run off up the mountain, and it was. Um, it was shaking the bushes as it went. But before that happened, it was going around the mountain and it kept reappearing in the same place and then running up the side of the mountain again, then reappearing again. It's almost like kind of something playing on a loop. I think, yeah, I think these experiences are visceral um, interactions with place. Um, at least that's part of them. I'm not saying that, you know, you can explain the whole thing in terms of that, but it seems to be what... Uh, often triggers these experiences and you know like I was saying before about this process of like in mediumship for example where it's a long sustained process of concentrating concentration and interaction mm. um, to build up a presence but I think there are some places like for example you know in in my presentation the men going down into the cave you know going down into a cave is a visceral experience and it puts you into a particular, you know, sort of like responsive state, I suppose, ready to have some kind of an experience with something, regardless of what it is. And I think a similar kind of scenario is at play with the with the account from the Guardian of the Mountain that we were talking about, mm. you know, where the, the loud growling kind of kicks the kicks off the experience. Yeah. Um, and what I what I think is that these kinds of spontaneous experiences, they're using the same processes as um, the sort of spirit manifestation that I was talking about with mediums, but they don't require the same amount of, um, of ritual kind of coaxing sure. um, to bring them, you know, into the, to bring them into the social reality <laughs> because they're already very strong, uh, strong presences in the landscape. And that's why, you know, you can go to some places and you just have a feeling that that place is a haunted place, for example. Mm. And this is what Rudolf Otto, basically Rudolf Otto said that this is kind of like the origin of religion, really, that you people were moving through the landscape and they moved into places that felt like they had a particular presence or a particular you know, feeling response. Otto talked about the numinous. That was what he thought the numinous was essentially the the basis of all religion, this experience that people have. And tying into what you were saying earlier, the numinous was characterized by terror and awe. Two yeah. polarities of it. Uh, one is the mysterium tremendum, which is where it's terrifying and you don't know what's going on and you're afraid, you feel like you might die. And the other side of it is the awe and wonder and the beauty, the, the beauty of it. Yeah. yeah. And also the feeling of a attraction towards it yes um, like it's a novelty mm. so, yeah uh, so this is what Rudolf Otto said that there are some places that give rise to this kind of experience and then his argument was what happens then is that people give a label put a label on that place or an, or they name it um as a, a you know a spirit of place yeah okay and then it builds and builds and builds. So then eventually you might have a shrine built there, for instance, um, and then the God takes, the, the spirit takes on, you know, a more divine form 
and so on. And this was basically his argument. You know, all religions stemmed from this, basically, a prim he called it sort of it like a primitive, deeply ingrained um, human feeling response that occurs in certain situations. Yeah. So, yeah. I think there's two things I want to say about that. Um, um, is that, um, first of all, with, you know, you were saying that some, you know, people have a feeling about a certain place and then they might put a shrine there. And in that particular case with Garden and Mountain, of course, there was a chapel there. Mm -hmm. And I wonder why, you know, um, I think I did ask him at the time who the chapel was dedicated to. And it was, um, it was some kind of aspect of the Virgin Mary. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so it's, at some point, somebody felt the sacredness of that place and put a chapel there. But also over time, um, this this kind of wise man who um, worked kind of on behalf of, of the king of Spain at the time, he set up this place there where he could he could live there as a, a hermit and have a whole library of occult books there and he would um I guess work his magic and live there and be there so there's all these different layers you know of people making sense of this place these places but also it makes me think of um and you you talked about this a lot in greening the paranormal um you know a sense of personhood with a place and I think that if it's a bit like with people uh, we we do kind of sense and feel people's vibes, if you want to call it call it that. Um, and there are some people that we innately kind of want to be closer to, and and there are some people that um, we innately feel. You know, you may never have met them before, but you can just sense that um, you know that you need to keep your wits about you, kind of thing. Um, so that sense of personhood then being we, we, we can make sense of that in the landscape too that there are these places even in places of great beauty um there's a sense of warning given you know um that that you know lots of different generations of people pick up on i think um this issue of personhood um you know because personhood is really um it's a human category, you know, it's a human thing, you know, maybe other things don't think in terms of personhood, but it's a human thing. And I think it's a human way of um, establishing relationships. Mm. Again, it all comes back down to this thing. And, you know, we establish relationships with other persons. So it's a very important category because, you know, the things that we consider persons or not, you know, all automatically dictates, you know, how we're going to interact with those things. Yeah. You can see the way this has panned out in, you know, like, well, I mean, Nazi Germany, for example, when people, people are not considered as persons, then they get treated in very destructive ways. So, you yeah. know, personhood in a lot of ways is about establishing a relationship or who do we, who are we going to establish relationships with? And I think that's the same um, with with place as well. We we use the same processes of determining personhood in in a place. And if we get that sense of the personhood of a place, then we relate to it better. Um, you know, we give it a name. Again, it's the same thing that, that Otto was talking about. You know, we give it a name. It becomes a relatable entity, and we kind of come to know it. Yeah. And we establish a relationship and then we can actually have a communication. Yeah. Um, and, you know, many, this is a peculiar thing about Western ways of thinking about personhood is that they've tended to, well, focus purely on the hum human, really, you know, in, a, in our yeah. Western society. Uh, what other persons are there? <laughs> Even animals are not, we don't really think about animals as persons. I mean, maybe we do on an individual one-to-one -one basis, but on a bigger cultural scale we don't and the same goes for you know broader ecosystems as well in the western world i mean we used to have these frameworks and i think all of this fairy folklore um, associated with particular landscapes and environments is a, a remnant of that older way of engaging with 
the you know the environment as a person yeah we had it and um it's kind of being lost as well or forgotten about but you know that also raises because if it's been forgotten then it suggests that it's a purely cultural thing you know that can be forgotten but it's not an experience I don't know because I mean I would say I definitely have experienced that I think yeah. personally speaking I guess you have too and I know other people would agree um, that they have that there are some places where I've been to and they are that there's something about them that it's like you're meeting them for the first time and uh, there's an ambivalence there there's there's you're not entirely sure if you're welcome or not yeah. if it's got a strong personality mm -hmm. and then over time that can really shift to the point where if I go to some of those places now where I initially was like oh okay I'm you know this is interesting this is an interesting sense here I now feel like I'm being welcomed by an old friend if I go there and it's it's a place you know um so you know that's something that I've experienced and I know lots of other people have so I would I would say that it is more yeah. experiential yeah I think the experience is still there but the question is you know like are people still telling stories about it mm. or do we have individual experiences like I've had my sister had and we just kind of keep it to ourselves and it doesn't yep. then become folklore does it um it stays sort of hidden and private yes I'm very interested as well to know not just whether there are you know stories still circulating in the area but also whether people are still actually having experiences as well mm. I think they probably are but we don't like to talk about those kind of experiences anymore <laughs> no this is it and I think you know um listening to your your um seminar about deep weird mm -hmm. now what really fascinated me about that and i was i'm really keen to ask you about this is this this idea of the boggle threshold yeah and you know i feel like we're talking about people whether or not they feel able to talk about their experiences you know i guess a big part of this project well the main the main part of the project for the Modern Fairy Sightings uh, project is that it's a place for people to share their experiences so that other people who've had those experiences can just go, oh, okay, yeah, this, you know, it's not just me and it's some way that they can go and relate and validate their own experiences. But as a side effect of that, if other people find the podcast um, and they listen to it, <laughs> I suppose, re, you know, thinking about the boggle threshold, I, I'm hoping, I guess, that it might raise some boggle thresholds there. Yeah. And, and in doing so, if that just sort of gets normalized that people have these experiences, then people will start talking about places maybe in that sort of way again, because they can relate to it, because probably most people have. You know, it's like, even if you think about, say, in lockdown, you know, we really kind of looked well, so deep within ourselves and we, you know, we were all going through trauma in some way or another. Mm -hmm. And one thing that people would do would be to go off, you know, for a walk, which they might not have been able to do had they been at work, but if they're working from home, I know not everyone was in this situation, but for a lot of people, it was like this. And just to be able to go to a local park and find a place of peace and feel nurtured and welcomed you know that I feel that's what we're talking about really in terms of like personhood of place so so yeah tell me about boggle threshold because yeah. that's it's really really interesting <laughs> yeah well um the idea of a boggle threshold it was from um the historian of psychical research Renee Haynes and uh, her idea basically was that everyone has their own threshold for the amount of weirdness that they can accommodate <laughs> and these thresholds are, uh, they're present in culture they're present in um you know our social family groups and our friendship groups and peer groups and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. they, they exist on an individual level um, but they also exist on sort of disciplinary levels as well so you know and she would talk about how you know, in the humanities, 
um, boggle thresholds are probably a little bit higher, higher or lower, depending on how you want to think about it. Okay. <laughs> to, let, to let the weird in. Okay. Um, and in the hard sciences, um, yeah, the boggle thresholds are either very high or very low uh, to prevent the weirdness from getting in. Mm. So they have different values, really. So yeah, um, this is what a boggle threshold is, and some you know, it comes through in all sorts of um, of interesting places in research on extraordinary experience. So for example, there is this whole literature that's pretty well established about religious experiences, going back to people like William James, and you know, they have a good strong lineage, and within that literature. There's certain kinds of experiences that um, it's kind of safe to talk about. Um, so things like, for example, you know, visions of uh, religious figures, for instance, mm. is a pretty a pretty standard one, or um, seeing um, lights or things like that, visions of lights or or whatever. These are kind of safe standard experiences that you can talk about. Or hearing voices and things like that. You know, mm, very okay. weird experiences, undou undoubtedly, but they're also safe and they're kind of well documented and well established. But then there are other kinds of experiences that seem to exceed people's boggle thresholds. And they can't let them in. And usually that's when experiences start to um, break down or blur distinctions between nice neat academic categories so for example you know it, it's all well and good to talk about a nice clean um religious experience for example someone has a vision of of jesus or the buddha or whatever mm. um but then if you introduce into that experience a flying saucer <laughs> or yeah. it happened on psychedelics or there was some kind of weird telepathic communication between the experiencer and the entity or, you know, anything like that. As yeah. soon as it starts to get more complicated, um, then the boggle threshold kicks in <laughs> and the experiences get kind of brushed away to the side and they become what Charles Fort called, you know, damned facts, essentially. Mm. Things that science doesn't want to accommodate because either because it, doesn't fit into the established frameworks and categories that science has got, or because it, it challenges, uh, you know, fundamental assumptions of science, for instance, um, or not just science, you know, or culture or a religion, you know, religions also do this, don't they? They allow certain things and they disallow other things. And so it's a really interesting idea, the boggle threshold. You can see how influential it is but also how it can um it can divert attention away from some of these more subtle complexities and it can it can almost it's almost um yeah it almost reduces extraordinary experiences into these neat categories when actually in reality they're often much more chaotic and interconnected and this is it yeah yeah, I think, you know, the latest um, episode, um, Wretched Rider in the Thorn, and that ended up, you know, it, it had a, you know, a UFO experience that kicked it off. And um, he'd also been going up there with some friends and they'd done, a, you know, sort of done a ritual and, and sort of got chased off the mountain by a really strong wind, this kind of wind of spirit. And, and that was interesting hearing how various members of that group, one of one particular was very skeptical. And they were the ones that said, it feels like the spirits are telling us to go, you know, things like that. So people were really, really feeling this. Um, and, um, you know, it might be on the one hand, if if you were doing this research, you might just say, "Oh, well, okay, I'm I'm researching fairy experiences," because you know the the crescendo of the whole thing was that um, he was coming off, you know, coming he'd, he'd gone there to meditate uh, in a in a you know a highly charged emotional state. So he was having a bad time, and as he he walked away, he came face to face with this creature, otherworldly creature, clinging to the mane of a horse 
um and you know it's was staring right at him and um and as he got closer it bared its teeth now he had no choice but to walk towards it because his car was back that way and the and there was no way to get the other side because it was a sheer cliff face where he'd walked from so he he literally had no choice but to walk towards it and this this event happened which was terrifying but also at the same time really amazing for him as well you know exactly what you were ex describing before so there are all these again there's these layers to um what happened and I, and as a fairy researcher I could say oh well I'm just interested in this bit this fairy um, aspect of it but you know like you I I feel like you need to look at the whole picture here um not only because all of that took place on this landscape but also because of his own experience what was happening to him so you know we could look at the landscape itself and say right well it had been the scene of you know bloody battles and goodness knows what else really because there had been you know very early Britons and then um, you know battles and Romans and just all sorts of different uh, layers of experience happening um, on that that mountain but like I said also his experience too so um, you know I think I think you've got to look at the whole picture and yes it does become more difficult as, than what we're used to I suppose but do you think say for instance in the um in with with anthropology people's boggle thresholds and I'm talking about academics here and willingness to look at the kind of holistic take, take a holistic um mm. you know approach do you think that that is shifting in anthropology yeah um, I think, um, well, anthropology is a very broad, sure. broad thing as well. Yeah. Um, there are field, there are parts of anthropology that are very um, sort of biological and to do with human evolution and all of that kind of stuff, which is for those kinds of anthropologists, all of this, um, this kind of talk, you know, <laughs> is something else. But for um, within social and cultural anthropology, Again, there are some strands of it that are much more sort of positivistic, but there is also the more interpretivist kind of uh, angle. And within that, I mean, this is what anthropologists have been doing you know, from the very beginning, really, but there is a whole you know, tradition and there are methods um, for engaging with other people's you know, worldviews and different beliefs and things like that. I mean, this is what anthropological you know social anthropological bread and butter exactly so i think um you know anthropology is in a really good place you know for people who want to take a, a scholarly yeah. academic approach to these kind of things anthropology is in a great place there's already you know that body of literature there that you can build on um and in more recent years as well there's been the growth of this uh sort of paranthropological thing which I've been involved with but I've tried but you know it didn't come from me it's got a long lineage that goes right you know right back to the beginning of anthropology really but it's definitely since in the last 10 years um there's there has been a bit of an opening up I think of, mm. of these uh, anthropologists yeah what do you think is causing that? What do you think is is behind this opening? Because I think that you're you're seeing it and feeling it in the academic world, um, but I think we're also just generally feeling it. I mean, you know, people are talking about these things more. People are interested. I mean, look at cult, you know the the culture in it itself, particularly youth culture. You know, I've got a nineteen year old son, and he's tells me that um you know a lot of his friends are really into all sorts of occult and supernatural stuff not that he is necessarily himself but it, it's a it's a cultural thing and you know with television and stranger things and you know it, this is really massive people are kind of reminds me a little bit of the 70s actually because the 70s yeah. was a bit like this as well the occult <laughs> revival exactly so yeah what, what what's your thoughts on that well, I mean, um, 
these things um, come, they go through phases, don't they? They mm -hmm. flare up and then they die back down and they flare up again. And lots of people have suggested all sorts of different reasons why that might be the case. But, you know, one thing that is happening at the moment, obviously, is a lot of um, fear and uncertainty and all of that kind of thing. Mm. And it's the classic, you know, psychological functionalist explanation for the supernatural, which I don't necessarily 100% buy, but I think it's a part of it, is that there is a lot more anxiety and a lot more thinking about things like death, for example. Mm. um which you know makes you think and question doesn't it and explore new po other possibilities so there is that That's true but i also think um you know it, we could go we could look at this from another perspective like from a postmodernist kind of view <laughs> and talk about the fragmentation of society and how yeah. everyone's become more um individually kind of oriented and, you know, when we talk, we move, we move into the domains then of individual spiritualities and things like that, where we we have a freedom, you know, especially in um, Western societies, to sort of pick and choose the, the beliefs and ideas that we adopt and that we kind of incorporate into our identity. So we're much freer than people were, you know, 50, yeah. 100 years ago to, to do that. Um, Long may so that continue. That. Yeah. Um, but another thing that I quite like the idea of as well is um, one of Charles Fort's ideas about dominance. And this is kind of like his a precursor to the idea of paradigms from Thomas Kuhn in the 60s. But Charles Fort was writing about this in like 1900. And he said a dominant is a, like a, a long period of. Um, you know, when a, a particular model of the world is in ascendance and all other, other worldviews are kind of lesser. And he said that, we, you know, at the moment or when he was writing, we were in a dominant of um, exclusion where we, we were excluding stuff from our worldview. You know, so he was amassing all of this damned data that science wasn't interested in. So his view of science was that it was excluding all of this stuff. But he had a vision of a future society that was more inclusive, you know, a, a dominant of inclusion is what he talked about. Mm. And I think in a lot of ways, we're moving in that kind of direction. He preempted it, you know, 120 years ago. But we're moving towards bringing things in. Well, this is what I'd like to see anyway, bringing things in rather than excluding stuff. That's right. And, you know, we have, you know, now proliferations of uh, different kinds of gender identities, for instance. Mm. You know, this is an inclusive, you know, not excluding people because they feel differently and things like that, but actually embracing that complexity and diversity. And, uh, yeah, I think yeah. that might be, that might be part, that's an optimistic view <laughs> of what's happening, because obviously there are other processes that are going on yeah as well yeah i mean in that way it does feel expansive doesn't it it yeah. feels like something is growing it feels expansive and it does feel like this is growing and, and it, it, even before covid although i suppose that that whole time since kind of covid lockdown has definitely pressurized things even more and even more people mm -hmm. are interested in this but even even before that i mean even sort of particularly from about sort of five years ago you know people became much much more interested in in these sorts of subjects so maybe we were we were heading in this direction and this this intense time has accelerated that um and that kind of sense of looking within yourself as well maybe looking looking for your own truths um what makes sense to you because when everything that you're seeing is so chaotic perhaps that's just what innately what we do we, we just have to kind of look for the truth because it doesn't seem apparent externally um but you know it it's uh it's an interesting thing because we we all find different truths as well <laughs> well that's true and then you know i was thinking about um we used to pronounce it weber weber yeah. um didn't know if it was weber or weber it's we used to 
<laughs> yeah. Um, the, um, Weber argued about science and technology taking over, over from um, magic and religion. But that kind of looks like it's switching around again, which is quite interesting. I mean, okay, we've got this massive, you've got, you know, we can't really do that technology. But also, there's a big backlash about um, towards technology at the moment as well. Is, yeah. So, so this is interesting. So, you know, is it swinging? Are we seeing a swing back round again? Right now, another but... interesting thing um, is the the way that technology is kind of feed into and become a part of all of this stuff like new emergent technologies like for example um you know like text messages from the dead and things like that right you know, old phenomena um merge into new technological spaces mm. and it, it gives opportunities for new kinds of interactions you know i wonder about um you know fairies and technology and you know, new new forms of uh, of uh, fairy experience that are mediated by technologies. I mean, I can imagine. I it probably has already happened <laughs> somewhere. But you know, it's like, it's yeah. interesting, isn't it? It opens up new new possibilities for for these old experiences to to adapt and move forward. It's true. Yeah, I would like to hear about anything like that if um. <laughs> Yeah. If any, I mean, you know, people talk about there being gremlins in the in the system and things like that. I suppose you know we were used to that, weren't we? But um, yeah, yeah, that is interesting. Um, well, I guess we've had a bit of that tonight with my <laughs> Wi-Fi going haywire as well. So the four theories that um, you had spoken about were um, so there's David Hufford's experiential, which we've also talked a little bit about as well and then John Keel's window areas so these places where the supernatural might exist and um, the sacred geography the Mercia Eliad idea and then Dirk Hamm's idea that they're that all these things are just social constructs produced by society for the benefit of society a little bit like say religion might be to you know to allow things to function in a certain way um, I guess my feeling on that was that it might be a little bit of all of those things. Is that what you've kind of concluded? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Usually that's the case that, you know, it's, it's not an either or situation. It's a both and plus other things as well. This is what I mean by when I talk about ontological flooding, you know, that in order to understand any situation, we need to be open to multiple simultaneous processes um, all functioning at the same time and these these things they might not even be you know they could be all sorts of different things you know not just physiological and psychological processes and all that kind of stuff but you know bringing in the idea of there being subtle minds and or plants and things like that having consciousness you know the all of these things are going to be interacting in any given situation so we need a framework that allows us to bring in all of these different strands. So when we talk about um, Monsieur Eliad and Rudolf Otto, for example, saying that you know, we can have these experiences in the world, that there is a, a thing out there, you know, that's all well and good, but it's also just one part of the stuff. You know, Durkheim saying that it's all created, socially constructed, essentially, and he's not wrong, <laughs> you know, it is all socially constructed as well. You know, when we, when we interact with these things, we know from, you know, all sorts of um, a accounts and analyses of different people's accounts that we bring our cultural mm. uh, lenses to bear on these experiences. And, you know, we, we do create stories and we do tell stories. And it is human beings that keep these traditions alive in the same way that Durkheim says. We do go back to these places, yeah. you know, ritually. It becomes a social and ritual thing. So it's not as simple as saying it's just, yeah, like you're saying, it's not just socially constructed. It is socially constructed, but there are other things as well. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So that's where yeah. I'm at with it. 
Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. That's, um, that's really great. And um, very excited for Deep Weird then. So when is that going to be coming well, out? Well, yeah, the plan is for it to come out. Um, it should be early to mid next year. Oh, cool. Another, okay. Another thing associated with Deep, yeah, the chapters were, were due in on Halloween. So I've started to get them all coming in now. Um, in May, I'm also going to be doing a Deep Weird Symposium for the Parapsychological Association about um, deep weird or high strangeness um, and parapsychology and what parapsychology might be able to tell us about um, high strangeness. <laughs> so that would be fun. And it should That'd coincide with the book, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, well, definitely um, let us know about that then near the time. And yeah, yeah. that sounds brilliant. Okay, well, thank you very much again for Eva, uh, giving your time and uh, having a good old chinwag about these matters. And um, all the best with all your projects as well. Thank you very much. And to you too. Okay, then. Cheers. Thank you.